Last time on What If A Cell Jr. Survived. After the events of the Cell game, Six swore revenge against the man who killed his family. He'd spend the next six years preparing himself for a battle to come, and although he'd run into some complications, he'd overcome them and emerge far stronger than he could ever imagine. As for Gohan, the young warrior did the same, swearing that he'd make the android pay for the countless deaths he caused in his pursuit for power. And when the time came, these two would engage in a life or death battle that ended in the defeat of Six through the use of Vegeta's final flash and Gohan's Kamehameha. Six's story continues now. On a destroyed Cell Games arena, Six laid unconscious with a body that had been torn asunder. The android began to shift and stir as he started to come to. Once awake, Six would regenerate, but even with his body reformed, the damage that he has sustained from his previous battle leaves the warrior extremely exhausted. So you're finally awake, huh? A voice called out to him. Six would recognize who it was and his anger would begin to rise. What is the meaning of this? Why the hell am I still alive? Six says as he looks at his hands. And why are you here? To finish me off? The android scoffs, his eyes meeting with the nameless Namekians. Piccolo looked down at the android, telling him that he'd gladly put him out his misery, but the choice wasn't his to make. If it was up to me or anybody else, you'd already be dead. Consider yourself lucky that Gohan saw things differently, Piccolo says. Six clenches his fist at the mere mention of the Saiyan's name, and his blood would begin to boil at the thought of being spared by him of all people. So tell me, what makes you so different? As far as I'm concerned, you're just as much as a monster as your father. But yet, here you are, Piccolo axes, and Six stares blankly at the Namekian, still lost in his anger. Get out of here, Namekian. Before I do something that you'll regret, Six says as he struggles to his feet. Piccolo chuckles and he tosses the android a sensu beam. Consider this a peace offering. I'd advise you take it, because I promise you, if you threaten Gohan again, there won't be any second chances, Piccolo says as he takes off. The arena falls silent as Six stares at the sensu beam. He'd pick it up and Piccolo's words run through his head. He'd begin to chuckle and his chuckle turns into laughter. He'd laugh and he'd laugh until the entire arena echoed with nothing but his voice. The thought of Gohan sparing him after what he did to his family made his skin crawl, and the thought of Piccolo of all people threatening him infuriated him. Yet what else could he do but laugh? Because deep down, he knew that there wasn't a thing that he could do. Six grits his teeth and lets out a rage induced yell. He crushes the sensu bean and his key explodes and he rockets into space. Once there, Six uses the empty void to calm his nerves and he begins to ponder on how to get revenge. But the more he thought about it, the more he realized that it'd be far too risky to go after Gohan again, as he knows the Z fighters are bound to interfere. He thinks about taking them out individually, but he doesn't know how fast the others will respond. So as much as he hated the idea of waiting, he wouldn't have any other choice. After coming to terms with this, Six finally returns to Earth with a new plan in mind. If he couldn't defeat Gohan without the interference of any of the other Z fighters, then he'd have to get strong enough to deal with them all at once. And knowing that it might take some time, Six began to look for an island where he could conduct his training in peace. He'd search high and low for an island with some sort of wildlife, as he didn't want to spend his time completely alone, as he found that having some companionship wasn't such a bad thing. He'd eventually find one with a large population of diverse wildlife, and he decides that it will suffice. When Six lands, he'd rest for the time being until he was able to recover his strength, and after a few days, he began to train at full power. Seeing as he didn't have to worry about hiding his presence from the Z Fighters anymore, he knew that he could train as hard as he liked. So for the next few days, Six would continue to push himself harder than he's ever done before, and he'd already begun to notice the difference in the rate of his improvement. The next day would go as it did normally, with Six training until nightfall and interacting with the wildlife here and there. However, as his day came to an end, he'd noticed that something was different. Everything within his vicinity had grown silent, followed by the sounds of multiple bushes and trees rustling, and not long after, a tranquilizer dart hit Six's neck. Get it, someone yelled, and a large group of people emerged from the forest. Nets and lassos were thrown in droves in an attempt to capture the android. After the dust had settled, Six emerged unscathed and visibly annoyed. He raises his key and pushes everyone back. And which one of you would happen to be the leader of this group of idiots? Six axes. Every one of the men freeze in place and they all point at one man. Six stares daggers at the leader and the man rushes back through the bushes in fear of his life. Six has a place in front of him and grabs him by the neck. However, before Six could say anything, he noticed numerous trucks filled with countless trapped animals and the sight of this unnerved the android. Set them free. Now, Six says, tossing the leader onto the ground. Once the animals are free, Six lets them know that if he sees them step foot on this island again, he'd make sure to kill them, and the men would immediately leave the island. With them gone, Six continued his training, and as the days went by, everything went back to normal. That is until one morning, the android awoke to a familiar face. Brother, Six said, tearing up as the words left his mouth. Six hugged the young android tightly, and his brother did the same. 
I thought you were dead, Six cried out as he continued to ramble about how much he missed him. After a few seconds of this, Six recomposed himself and asked if anybody else survived. His brother pointed to the forest as the rest of the Cell Juniors would show themselves, and for the first time in a while, Six smiles a genuine smile filled with joy and happiness. He embraces each and every one of his brothers and he'd ask them how they are alive. His brothers would explain that they had regenerated after the events of the Cell games, and they thought that he had been killed due to Six being missing when they came to. Six ponders on this information completely bewildered, but he set the thought aside as it didn't matter at this moment. You wouldn't happen to be Cell, would you? A voice called from the forest. Six looked around trying to figure out where the voice came from, but he couldn't sense any key. You're mistaking me for my father, and who are you? Six says as he stands in front of his brothers. Android 17 emerges from the forest, aiming a key blast at Six's face. You can say that I'm one of your father's old friends, 17 says as he circled around Six. As he does so, he'd notice that Six would constantly move so that he was always face to face with his attack. He looks at the other Cell Juniors behind him and asks, You seem to be very protective of those little guys. What are they to you? And Six lets them know that they're his brothers. 17 looked the android up and down and he'd wonder if this is how perfect Cell looked like. Is that so? Why do you look so different compared to them, 17 axes? Enough of these stupid questions. What do you want, 6 axes? Readying himself for a fight. 17 lowers his hands and he lets 6 know that he's only here to see what's been causing all this ruckus in the past two weeks. He then tells 6 about this island, about how he's the ranger here, what he does, and about how he's been watching over his brothers for the past six years. Six looks to his brothers and they confirm that he's telling the truth. As a result, Six finally lets his guard down and he thanks Seventeen for taking care of his little brothers. Seventeen says it's no problem and the two begin to talk. Seventeen would ask how he acquired his strength and Six would tell him about the six years he spent alone. Six years of non-stop training. What made you push yourself so hard? Seventeen asks. Revenge, Six says. Revenge, huh? I've been there before, Seventeen says, thinking back to when he killed Dr. Chirot. Letting you know now, it doesn't fix the problem. Things don't go back to normal, 17 says, looking at his hands. Doesn't matter if it makes things normal or not. I refuse to sit idly as the man who killed my father and tried to kill my brothers and I still lives, 6 says. 17 stares at the android, seeing a notable change in his demeanor and decides not to push the topic any further. Well, as long as you don't bring any of that trouble to my island, feel free to make yourself at home. I don't know why, but ever since I've noticed your present here, I haven't seen as many poachers snooping around, 17 says, and he begins to walk away and he tells the android that he has a long day ahead and he better get going. Oh, and I never got your name. Mine 17. What's yours? 17 asks. 6 would be caught off guard by this question. He had never thought about it. As far as he could remember, he didn't have a use for one. Call me whatever you want. It doesn't matter to me, 6 says. How about... Maito. There. Now you have a name. 17 says as he walks off. Maito. What a stupid name, Maito says with a smile on his face. Over the next couple of months, Maito would continue his training, always pushing himself to new heights each and every day. He trained alongside 17 and he'd make note that his strength would increase twofold when he was training with someone around his level. This caused the android to frequently ask 17 to spar. In turn, 17 asked Maito to help around the island to keep the poachers at bay. So through these sparring sessions and time spent chasing down poachers, the two androids would grow close. And after a long day of training and working, Maito and 17 sat around a fire with Maito's brothers fast asleep. Have you ever heard about the World Martial Arts Tournament? 17 axes breaking the silence. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, my father's tournament was based on it. What about it? Don't tell me you plan on wasting your time competing, Maito says. No, just something to talk about. My sister mentioned it when I talked to her recently. Says she plans on joining for the prize money, 17 says. Money? Well, whatever her reason is, it's not like she can lose, Maito says. I don't know about that. She told me that a couple of her husband's friends are going to be there. And they aren't exactly pushovers, 17 says, thinking about the Z Fighters. You know, you never really told me who exactly you wanted revenge on, 17 says. His name is Sun Gohan. I believe you've met him before, Maito says. He then tells 17 about the fight that took place between him and Gohan a year prior and how he almost killed the half Saiyan. But then those damn friends of his got in the way, Maito says. He continued by telling him about the aftermath, how Gohan pitied him and how Piccolo threatened him. 17 ponders on everything Maito told him, and after a few moments of silence says, I know you probably don't want to hear this, but have you ever stopped to think that maybe Gohan did what he did to protect his loved ones, just like you would do to protect yours? Maito says nothing as he looks at his brothers. I'm just saying, try to look at it from his perspective, and maybe you'll realize there's something in that kid that's worth sparing. I mean, he must have done the same for you. 
why else would you still be alive? 17 says, he then get up telling Maito that it's getting late and he needs to head back home. Once alone, Maito ponders on his conversation with 17, thinking about what he said before he left. He'd give it a try, but he'd stop almost immediately, annoyed at himself for even trying. Why the hell would he even try to defend that brat, Maito says to himself, and as their conversation ran through his head one last time, he'd realize something. That being that the only people that could rival 18 are none other than the Z Fighters. He thinks to himself that this could be his time to act. He knows that he's gotten far stronger thanks to his training with 17, as well as not having to hold back to Hype's presence. But Piccolo's words would echo through his head, and as mad as it made him, he couldn't afford to be as reckless as he was before. He looks to his brothers and decides that he'll take a different approach. When the day of the tournament came, Maito sat atop a massive building, looking down onto the ring. He planned to watch from afar in order to gauge the Z Fighters' strength and act accordingly. Events play out like they do in canon, and once the Z Fighters chase after Yamu and Spopovich, Maito tails after them, keeping a safe distance behind the warriors to avoid detection. Due to this, when he finally arrived at Bobby's ship, Gohan, Vegeta, Goku, and the Supreme Kai already entered to face off against Bobby's men. At first, Maito thinks about going in after them, but decides against it as Goku and Vegeta were bound to enter. Fear. As for how things will play out for the Saiyans within Bobby's ship, well, for the most part, nothing really changes. That is until Gohan faces off against the Bora. Seeing as Gohan would be stronger here than he was in canon, he wouldn't have a hard time taking down the Demon King. However, unlike Goku and Vegeta who straight up killed their opponents, I believe that Gohan would hesitate in killing the Bora, and this would most likely anger Vegeta, and he'd have a similar outburst like in canon. But instead of him being infuriated by Gohan's lack of strength, he'd be upset with how soft Gohan still is despite being the strongest one of them all. And this is where Majin Vegeta would be born. After a few canon events, Goku and Vegeta commence their long-awaited rematch, and Gohan and the Supreme Kai chase after Babidi, which leads to the wizard teleporting himself, the Bora, the Half Saiyan, and the Kai up to the surface. Maito watches in astonishment as the warriors seemingly appear out of nowhere, but he'd be more surprised to see that Gohan was all alone. No Goku, no Vegeta, or any other obstacles in sight. Any android cracks a smile. Maito's key erupts with extreme ferocity, catching the attention of everyone on the battlefield. Who's that? Supreme Kai asked. Gohan began to tremble as he sensed Maito's key climb higher and higher. Trouble, Gohan says. Maito lays waste to the ground below him and he tears through the sky and lands a mighty punch that barely gets blocked by Gohan. Please, this isn't the time for revenge. There's a bigger threat that needs to be stopped, Gohan says, struggling to hold Maito back. Maito laughs and breaks through Gohan's guard, landing a devastating punch, knocking the Saiyan back. You of all people should know that none of that matters to me. Now get up and fight, Maito says as he rushes in and the two warriors break out into a ferocious battle. Whilst the two fought, Babidi watched in astonishment at the power surging from this new being as well as the malice coming from his heart. He knew that with his power, Boo could be reborn in no time, so the wizard would cast the Majin spell onto the android in hopes of acquiring his strength. Maito holds his head in pain as Bobby's words fill his mind and Maito's power would begin to rise. Get out! Get out of my head, Maito yells out as his key erupts, pushing everyone back. He locks eyes with the wizards. I have no use for your power. Try that again and I'll make sure that you regret it, Maito says. Infuriated, Babidi instructs the Bora to attack the android for threatening him. The Bora rushes in and within an instant, Maito unleashes all his strength and lands a devastating blow that ends the Demon King's life. Gohan stares in awe at Maito's power, making note of the gap between himself and the android. He could tell that they were no longer equals, and this reality terrified him. Maito's anger began to stir as he stared daggers at Babidi. The wizard fell back in fear of his life. However, before Maito could act, Boo's shell would begin to hatch. Babidi starts to laugh and goes on and on about how it's over for them. What are you going on about, Maito axes? Suddenly, Gohan's power explodes as he charges up a full power Kamehameha and fires it quickly. Maito puts up his guard, but to his surprise, the attack flies right past him and hits Boo's shell. The android watches in astonishment as Gohan pours all his strength into this attack, and he realizes that whatever was in that container must truly be dangerous. Boo's shell finally hatches, and once the Majin is set free, Bobby commands Boo to kill the Supreme Kai. Gohan tries his best to fend the Majin off, but Boo tears through him and nearly kills the half Saiyan with a few hits. And just when Boo went to deliver the killing blow, Maito lands a powerful attack on the Majin, saving Gohan's life. Gohan struggles to his feet and begins to thank Maito profusely, but to his surprise, Maito grabs him by the throat and begins to crush it. Gohan struggles to breathe as he tears and claws at Maito's hand, trying to undo it. Maito looks Gohan in the eyes and says, I didn't do that to save you. If anyone's going to kill you, it'll be me. Maito squeezes even hard, but before he could take the half Saiyan's life, Boo fires off an attack that tears Maito in two. To Boo and Babidi's surprise, they'd watch as Maito regenerates. Of course. It's never that easy, is it? Maito says, looking at Boo. 
he drops Gohan and he makes his way to Majin. A battle ensues between the two warriors and at first it seems as if Maito was able to keep up, but Gu would quickly turn the tide of the battle and he demolished the android with ease. As the fight raged on, the Supreme Kai made his move and he teleported himself and Gohan away from the battlefield, whilst everyone was distracted. Back over with the fight, Buu's rampage would continue with Maito trying his best to defend himself as much as he could, but his efforts would be in vain as Buu crushed through all of his defenses. Once Maito could no longer defend himself, Buu prepared to land a finishing blow, and just when Maito's fate seemed sealed, a tri-beam cannon crashes into the Majin. Get your hands off my brother, Maito's brother yelled out. To Maito's surprise, his brother rushes onto the battlefield in an attempt to save him. He lands a pretty strong attack on Buu, but the Majin doesn't budge. What are you doing here? You need to run, Maito yells out. The young android ignores him and continues to attack the Majin, but not a single one does damage. In a rage, Maito's brother starts to yell obscenities whilst attacking Buu and the Majin finally responds. He catches the young android's hands and begins to crush them. The android lets out a loud yell as the pain floods in. Let him go, Maito yells out. His key flares up as he fights through the pain of his injuries and lands a powerful blow against the Majin that sends him flying. Run, Maito yells out. Buu teleports in front of Maito and lands a crushing blow that leaves the android on the brink of death. The Majin would then turn his attention to the android and begin to beat him down. Maito tries his hardest to get up, but his body won't respond. He tries and he fails over and over again, but it's no use. His body was shot. Stop! Get away from him, Maito yelled out, as his anger continued to rise at the sight of his brother being brutally beaten. Buu eventually tosses the young android aside and begins to charge up a powerful attack, ready to finish him off. Maito, in a desperate attempt to save his brother, pleads with Buu to fight him, trying to take his attention away from his young brother, but his voice falls on deaf ears as the Majin unleashes the devastating attack, causing a massive explosion. The battlefield falls silent, and Maito watches as the dust clears, his brother nowhere in sight. Tears begin to trickle down the android's face, as the feelings of failure and loss flood in once again, but Maito's sadness quickly turns to hatred, as his anger rises higher and higher with each passing moment. The memories of his younger brother run through his mind and his thoughts berate him for not being able to protect him. His mind would become an echo chamber of all his failures, consistently reminding him of what he's lost and what he's going to lose if he continues to fail. Over and over again, these thoughts run through his head and eventually he snaps. Maito's eyes go blank and his key begins to violently surge, shaking everything within the vicinity. Majin Buu and Bobby watch in horror as the once defeated android stands before them, seemingly more powerful than ever. Maito lets his key erupts and taps into his super perfect form. Buu takes a step back, overwhelmed by Maito's ferocity. Maito's key would continue to climb higher and higher, but suddenly it stopped, and when the dust settled, the android stood unconscious. Although his body wanted nothing more than a rip Buu to pieces, his body could no longer move forward and Maito collapsed. And with that, this marks an end to this part. Thank you to everyone that watched this video. I hope you have a great day. Peace, peace. Deuce, deuce.